Um, so first off, just I'll introduce myself a little bit. So I'm Shashir Marotra. Uh, my background, I went to school out east at MIT. Um, don't hold that against me here. Um, I uh, left school to start a company called Centrata. That was back in the uh, 2000 cycle. Uh, then spent a few years at Microsoft, worked on uh, Office, then Windows, and SQL Server. Then spent six years at Google, mostly working on YouTube. That's mostly what we'll talk about today. And I left Google about a year ago to start a new company. Uh, and, and I don't actually plan to say much about that today. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about what, what I'm going to talk about. So over the course of uh, six years at YouTube, we, we, we learned a lot of different things. Um, and what I did was I tried to pick out some lessons from that, from that period. And just to give you context, I joined YouTube 2008. Um, and uh, people may forget, but YouTube was in a very different state at that time. YouTube had just been purchased by Google, a little over 100 people. Um, at, at the time, actually not seen as a success. It was seen as a great exit, but seen as a company that may still fail. It was a lot of, a lot of uh, people who thought that Google made a big mistake in the acquisition. Um, and six years later, it looks uh, very different. We'll talk about uh, uh, some of how those changes happened. Um, let's see, I wrote down a couple notes of preamble before we get started. Let's see. So. Uh, oh, my, my role at YouTube. So my role was a little bit non-traditional, so I thought I would explain a little bit how that worked. Um, so officially, I was responsible for product engineering and user experience. We actually ran YouTube as a triumvirate. So a guy named Salar Kamangar was the, what you would call a chairman CEO. And then day-to-day -day operations were run by uh, myself and a guy named Robert Kinsel. So Robert generally handled the business side. So he'd handle sales, marketing, content partnerships, so on. And I handled the product, uh, product side. And the three of us did a lot of a lot of stuff together, so these stories are uh, mainly coming out of uh, out of those experiences. Um, one other caveat is I made uh, no attempt to be comprehensive. I think there's lots of things that matter as you scale. Uh, I prioritize counterintuitive and interesting. And in fact, the way we put the talk together was last night I sat down with a with a friend with uh, you know 20, 25 stories, and he stack ranked them for me. Um, so you're going to see the 10 that are interesting. Um, they may seem somewhat random in in different order, but hopefully. Uh, hopefully stuff that is uh, counterintuitive. Um, and then goals. So I have, I have two goals for today. Uh, I imagine this room has, uh, Reed was telling me, has a wide group of uh, people at uh, uh, various different points in their career. Um, the way I think about this is as you hit those moments of scaling, uh, my goal is to take some of, our, uh, some of these stories and A, um, help you recognize when you see one of those patterns, and B, give you a, a set of tools and lessons to apply uh, at those times, so I'll try and do that throughout uh, throughout the talk, and uh, I think that's it. Let's get started. So, um, so these are the ten we're going to talk through. Uh, I said it, they're not they're not sort of well structured, but I did find a natural grouping. Um, so the first two uh, I call choose wisely, and you know the the, the general uh, theme there is. Um, I don't know how many people here are poker players, but uh, every poker player will tell you uh, learning how to play poker is partially about learning how to play the game, but mostly about learning how to pick which table to sit down on. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how you pick which table to sit down on. Uh, charting the course, I think of as uh, the core of running a business. What, what are, how do you make hard choices? Um, how do you think about uh, ecosystems, values, so on? And then uh, the, the last three I'll focus on, on some team-related things. How do, you, how do you pick people? How do you organize them? What's your own role in those situations? And, and so on. So that's, that's going to be the 10. Um, good. All right, let's start. So tailwinds. Um, so let's start with uh, uh, tailwinds. The main less, the, the uh, story I want to tell here is a, a bit about the YouTube tailwinds. And really, the, the main um, uh, point I want to talk about here is how to pick businesses that have great tailwinds. So we'll start by looking at what, how we used to describe the, the YouTube tailwinds. So this, uh, this is how we described it for YouTube. So back in 19, 1988, number one show on TV was The Cosby Show. Um, Cosby Show got a 25-point rating, uh, had about a 50% household share. Uh, for people not familiar with uh, media metrics, what that means is if your TV was on on a Thursday night at 8 o'clock, there was a better than average chance you were watching The Cosby Show. Uh, you fast forward 10 years, the uh, number one show on TV was Seinfeld, very similar ratings, very similar household share. But if you go 10 years past that, you get to 2008, uh, and you see American Idol with a 12-point share. Um, now, uh, one interesting side note in this uh, story is uh, Seinfeld, in his first few episodes, actually didn't do that well. It's pilot in a few episodes after that. And so Seinfeld was almost canceled by the NBC executives. And if you go back and look at its ratings during that period, Seinfeld actually had better ratings than American Idol had in 2008. So the 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 new normal was set in a very short period of time. 
So one obvious question is what happened? Where did all those people go? Did they, did they stop watching television? Um, the answer to that is no. Actually, through that whole period, the, the number of hours a day the average American family spent watching television actually went up every single year. Um, what seems to have happened is this bottom line, uh, that the choice all of a sudden changed. And this, this chart is just looking at cable networks. This is about that in, in that time frame, uh, 2008, 2009. And this is just plotting cable networks on one axis and audience share on the other. Um, and just shows that about 50%, if you take all the networks that had uh, less than 1% share, they accounted for about 50% of viewership. And ones that had uh, less than half a point share uh, accounted for 30% of viewership. Half a point is an Im important mark because it's actually where Nielsen stops measuring. Um, and so that this was, you know, that's about the amount of viewership that's sort of unaccounted for uh, on television. Um, so how does this apply to, to, to YouTube? So the YouTube thesis uh, mapped directly to this narrative. And the way we would uh, talk about it is the, uh, uh, if you look back over the history of television, there, used, there was a long period of time where we had three major networks. Uh, Fox got added in uh, uh, later. Uh, and then over a short period of time, that turned into hundreds of cable channels. And the, the, the YouTube tailwind uh, was this trend we saw that we thought uh, or think that the uh, same transition was about to happen in the online video world. Or to say it differently, we believe online video is going to do to cable what cable did to uh, broadcast television. We're going to go from tens of channels, or uh, you know, ones of channels to tens of channels to, to thousands or millions of channels. Um, okay, so why does this, this matter uh, here? Uh, wh one of the things I've uh, you know, been able to do across my career is work on lots of different types of products, uh, some that have great tailwinds, some that have great headwinds. Uh, and if I had to give one clear lesson, it's work on ones that have great tailwinds. And th there's a few reasons why. One, one is that it uh, accelerates everything you do. You, you can do little things and they become amplified. Uh, but probably the biggest reason I say is it covers a lot of mistakes. And in the period of building something, you're inevitably going to make mistakes. I think picking things that have those tailwinds makes it much easier uh, to, to, uh, to weather through them. So that's uh, sort of lesson number one. Uh, when you're picking which uh, table to sit at, pick ones that have tailwinds. All right, number two, uh, let's talk about purpose. So um, Daniel Pink wrote this book. Anybody read this book? Uh, so it looks like a few. Uh, it's called Drive. Uh, it's about what, uh, what motivates people. The uh, book's pretty good. If you don't, if aren't that interested in reading it, go watch, there's a YouTube video of it. Uh, and if you're even less interested, I can summarize for you quickly now. Um, so, so the book is basically uh, he says what motivates, his theory, what motivates people is three things, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Uh, mastery is um, uh, the ability, uh, the, uh, being good at what you do. Autonomy is having the room and space to be able to do it well. And purpose is feeling a connection, feeling a connection between that and impact. And he tells a lot of great stories about how to look at each of those different things and how it impacts motivation and, and so on. Now, uh, over the years, I've, uh, I've come to the conclusion that of those three, the one that matters the most is, is purpose. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how I thought about purpose at uh, YouTube. And, and the story I want to tell is about uh, this fellow. Who knows who this guy is? OK, everybody knows. Good. Uh, so that's Sal Khan. I, uh, this guy, I assume less people know. His name is Imran. That's Sal's uh, eldest son. Um, and he's actually involved in the story, too. So um, let me tell you a little story about some of the early days at YouTube. So Sal, Sal and I actually went to college together. Um, and uh, stayed in pretty close touch. We both uh, ended up marrying our college sweethearts. Um, both our, actually, both our wives are physicians. Um, moved across the country about the, about the same time. Uh, we went different paths. He ended up in the hedge fund industry. I ended up in the technology industry. Um, but we would get together regularly. In 2008, I had just joined YouTube, and uh, he and his wife were over for, for dinner. Um, uh, and uh, so conversation started. And I happened to mention that I had just joined YouTube. And he said, oh, you know, I've, I actually use YouTube a lot. And I said, great, like, that's, that's wonderful. He said, no, 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 I use YouTube like I upload to YouTube a lot. Um, and he was trying to explain what he was doing. And for people that don't know the story, he's got this cousin in, uh, in Louisiana that he was helping with math homework. And the easiest way he could find to, uh, to tutor her was to have her send questions. And he'd post answers as, as YouTube videos and, and send them back. And re really, he was using YouTube because it was, easier, it was an easier way to send a video file. Um, he said, you know, it's, a, it's kind of interesting. I've been doing this, and a lot of people seem to be watching it. And the conversation kind of moved on. Uh, next day, I go to work, uh, and we had this uh, dashboard we could use to look up uh, how, how channels were doing. And this is 2008, so this is uh, Stanford and MIT had both uh, just started uploading all the footage of all their, um, all their classes to, uh, uh, to YouTube. 
And I go and I did some quick math and, uh, and realized that actually um, Sal was getting more viewership than Stanford and MIT combined. Um, so I write him a note. I say, I don't know if you realize this, but you know, you're, you're, you're kicking Stanford and MIT's butt. Um, uh, you have to get into the YouTube Partner Program. At the time, you couldn't make money on YouTube without being in the, in the Partner Program, and you had to get invited into that. Um, so we invited him to the Partner Program, and, and he, uh, he accepted uh, and started making money on YouTube. Um, so fast forward uh, a few months later, he and his wife are back over for dinner. Um, his wife happened to be pregnant, actually, with Imran at the time. Um, uh, my wife was pregnant with, uh, with our younger one at the time. And uh, uh, again, conversation turns to YouTube, and he says, sure, you know, thanks for, thanks for uh, setting me up in the partner program. It's been a great experience so far. Uh, and then he kind of pulls me aside a little bit, and he says, you know, uh, I've been doing some math, and uh, uh, looking at the checks coming in, and I think actually we're really close to them. Uh, you know, I can see clearly where this is going to cross uh, our rent. Um, and I've been thinking about it, and I can see a little bit further out, it might cross my hedge fund salary. I don't really like working at hedge fund, so I'm thinking about quitting and doing this uh, full time. And I said, what do you think I should do? And this is the moment where his wife, Umema, gave me the stare of death and said, uh, <laughs> you know, answer this, answer this question properly. And uh, th thankfully, I, I, I told him, you know, I just bet my career on it. I, I, I would uh, say... Uh, I would be encouraging of you doing the, the same. Now, th to be clear, you know, Sal's, uh, Sal's achievements are all his own, and I, I think I had this one li little tiny moment where I gave him a s little extra nudge. Um, but he did end up quitting, and uh, you know, the rest of the story, it sounded like everybody here knows, and you know, Khan Academy now reached m millions of people and have ten you know, tens of millions of users and so on. Um, but the interesting part about that story is, you know, imagine if this had played out just a few years earlier. Imagine if Sal had said, uh, I have this great idea, uh, and he'd gone to a, a cable network, and he had said, hey, I want, to, uh, I want to create this new educational show. And they would say, great, do you, have, uh, do you have any experience as a teacher? And he said, well, not really, but I think I'm pretty good at math. Uh, and so, okay, okay, do you have any experience as an entertainer? And I uh, said, no, not really, um, although he is pretty funny. The, uh, um, and I said, okay, well, tell me about the show. And he said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start at the uh, beginning of the algebra book, um, and I'm going to start solving problems. And when I get to the end of that book, I'm going to pick up the next book, and I'm going to do the same thing. And by the way, I don't want to show my face in any of the videos, and I don't want to have any storylines or plots or, or anything. You know, will you fund my show? Um, I think he would have gotten laughed out of just about every um, cable network out there. Uh, thankfully, he didn't have to pitch anybody. Um, and this is a, a theme we used to refer to as a gatekeeperless world. Um, uh, and he ended up being able to uh, start his career on YouTube, and now he's uh, arguably one of the biggest uh, educators on the on the planet. Um, now, the 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 reason this this matters here, um, you know, fa fast forward a, a few years later to uh, 2010, uh, I actually was um, let's say not feeling so good at work and was debating making a switch, being recruited by another firm, um, thinking about leaving YouTube. I have an advisor, a guy named Dean Gilbert. He, he, uh, so I called him up and, and said, what should I do? And he asked me to make, um, uh, he asked me to make three lists. And I think this would be helpful for you guys as well. So, so list number one, he said, what are you hoping to accomplish in the next year? Um, list number two, he said, okay, take that, take list number one and figure out which of those things um, wouldn't happen if you were to leave. And list number three was take list number two and say, which of those things would you feel really terrible about? Like, not terrible about the next day or the next week, but like months and years later, how, you know, which of those would you feel really terrible about? And you know, list number one, you could say, is, is goals, it's focus. Uh, so on list number two, I, I, I now refer to that as the marginal utility list. If you're in an environment where, where you're not actually having impact, if all the same stuff would happen with or without you, um, then you have to question why you're there. But list number three actually ended up being the, the, the most important, I, and I call that list purpose. Um, you could also sometimes people refer to it as a tombstone test, you know, only, only work on things that you, you want to have on your tombstone. I think that's a little morbid, so I like to use the word purpose instead. Um, uh, but one of my lessons was, you know, I think uh, no matter what you work on, whether, you, whether it's a small risky startup or what seems like a big stable company, you'll have moments of uh, uh, lack of confidence and you'll, 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 you'll see challenges that, that may not seem like ones you can overcome. And the things that get you through those periods are, are your sense of purpose. So when you're starting and figuring out where you want to sit, uh, I think picking things where you, where you feel that connection to purpose I think is, I think is really important. All right, that's number two. Number three, let's talk about theses. Um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I ended up at YouTube. Um, first off, I just wanted to set some context on what it felt like when I when I got there. So these were these are some of the headlines uh, that you know my mom would send me as I as I joined. So you're sure you're doing the right thing. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, you know it was it was far from obvious that YouTube was going to be a was going to be a success uh, at the time. Now. Um, you know, there's, a, uh, there's another book I'm assuming a lot of people here have read. Uh, it's one called Zero to One. Um, it has, this, uh, has a bunch of really interesting ideas. Uh, there's one I really like, which is this, uh, what important truth do very few people agree with you on? Um, I thought that was a, a really uh, good way to uh, describe a, a thesis. Um, and so one way to, to talk about my story of joining YouTube is, you know, it was kind of crazy to join YouTube at the time, um, but once I had a, a, a view on it that not a lot of people agreed with, uh, it was kind of inevitable. Um, so, so my story actually has to do with the, with the Super Bowl 2008. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so 2008, I uh, decided I wanted to leave Microsoft. Uh, I thought I wanted to go start a company. And uh, so I started coming down to uh, Silicon Valley, uh, meeting different people and, and so on. And uh, happened to get called by this guy, Jonathan Rosenberg, who's an old friend of mine, uh, happened to be running uh, product management at Google at the time. And he said, you got to come in and, and, and meet us at Google. I said, well, I don't know. I want to go start a company. I don't really want to go uh, be part of a, a, a big one. He said, no, 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 just come by and, and, and meet us. I said, all right, I'll, I'll come by. And so went in. And you know, of course, if you think Google was exciting now, I mean, it was incredibly exciting in, in, in 2008. Uh, and everybody's pitch was, was, uh, was really out there. And, you know, Sergey had his set of things he was working on. Eric had his set of things he was working on. Uh, Vic had just joined, and he was doing a bunch of new things and, and so on. But all of them were kind of all, you know, all over the place. And the, the last meeting of the day, I, I get together with Jonathan again. He, says, he said, what did you think? And I said, I don't know. They all seem kind of crazy ideas, but I think I still want to go do my startup. And he said, no, no, no you, don't under, you don't understand. Um, and, and for those of you that is John, John's not speaking in this class, is he? He's, a, he's actually a really good speaker um, for, for things like this. But uh, Jonathan um, says, things I'd say directly, or another way to put it, sometimes crassly. Um, he said, you're, you're totally missing the point. Um, uh, he said, Google is, uh, at its heart, not about Chrome and Android, all these other things. Google's an advertising company. And um, all, the, all the money in advertising seems to go to all these stupid TV ads. And nobody even watches those TV ads. And used a bunch of words I didn't use. Um, so. Um, I had never bought, bought or sold an ad in my life. I knew nothing about advertising. So he said all that, and um, it's actually all surprising to me. I, was like, I had no idea. I, you know, all the, like, in retrospect, it's kind of obvious. All the money in advertising goes to television ads. It's kind of obvious. Uh, but for me, I didn't know any of that. Um, so I get on a plane, I leave his office, get on a plane, and I start thinking about, um, start thinking about what he said. Um, and this happened to be just a couple weeks after, after the Super Bowl. And I don't know if people remember the Super Bowl, but it was actually a pretty iconic one. If any Pat Patriots fans are here, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, um, uh, but I started thinking about the Super Bowl. I said, and we, we, tend to we tend to throw a party for every Super Bowl. A bunch of our friends had come over. We'd uh, all watch together. And I was thinking, you know, he said that nobody watches those stupid TV ads. And yet that one day, that, you know, for, those, for those three hours, we, we watched every single ad. In fact, I remembered many times when people had said, hey, could you rewind it so we can see that ad again? Um, and so I took out a sheet of paper and I wrote at the top, um, what would it take to make television feel like the Super Bowl every day? Like, what, what's different about that day? Uh, and how could we recreate that experience every single day? Um, so I wrote down a series of ideas, went home, went to sleep. I uh, woke up the next morning, looked at that set of ideas, looked at my list of startup ideas, and said, ah, I don't know anything about advertising. Let somebody else do that. And so I write Jonathan and said, I don't think Google's for me. Thank you very much for hosting me. By the way, you mentioned something. I had, I had a few ideas for you. Whenever you want, I'm happy to give them to you. I'm sure you already thought of them. Uh, he happened to call me back, and uh, I walked him through some of those ideas. And he said, uh, uh, you may think they're obvious, but they're definitely not obvious here. We have nobody working on anything like that. Um, so if you really want to do that, you should come do it. Um, and you know, the, uh, through a series of conversations, he convinced me to, to give up on, on uh, starting this company, and, and I ended up, uh, through that, ended up working on, on, on YouTube. Now, um, those set of ideas became something called TrueView. Um, the, the basic idea was really simple. The, uh, the idea was uh, you should put a skip button on all the ads. That's what the user sees. Um, that insight by itself. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's sort of not enough. The, 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 the core of it was the idea that uh, 
the way to change advertising, especially video advertising, was to change the incentives. And the, the reason I felt that the Super Bowl ads were so much better than the rest of the year was that the incentives were different. That, and for a bunch of other reasons we can talk about later if people want to, want to hear about them. Um, but the, uh, what we want to do is recreate that experience uh, um, you know, all year round. And so the idea was put a skip button on ads, but also don't charge advertisers if people skip them. Um, and what that did was it created a completely different set of incentives. Now, now YouTube uh, had no interest in showing an ad that people wanted to, wanted to skip, and the advertisers had to build better and better ads if they actually wanted them to, to, to get watched. Um, uh, it was completely counterintuitive. I showed up, no, not only, uh, I mean, Jonathan wasn't underestimating it. There was, no, nobody was working on it, nobody believed in it. In fact, they were uh, incredibly negatively predisposed to it. Um, I had, I got in front of a sales team in a room kind of like this, and they kind of tore me to shreds. Uh, I said, are you crazy? You're gonna put a skip button on ads. All you're gonna do is erode all the revenue, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, while everybody skips their ads. Um, uh, thankfully, it was, it, was, uh, it was the right insight and ended up working, and now is a multi-billion dollar business, and the metric we mostly focused on was revenue per hour, for an hour of viewership of YouTube versus an hour of viewership of television, how did it compare? Um, and by the time I left, it was, it was about even, even between cable television and, and, and YouTube, um, which is a, a pretty amazing thing to think about with, with, a, with a set of skippable ads. Um, but one of, the, one of the lessons I learned from that is sort of back to, uh, back to the statement, um, is you know we Peter wrote this with a view towards starting a company. I think the same statement applies as you're scaling a company as well, and that the most interesting innovations happen uh, when you look hard at a, a problem and you, and you come up generally with very simple insights. Um, and those simple insights will often take a lot of time. In truth, it took us almost three years to get out, much less to get to uh, much less to get to scale. Um, but the the core of uh, really making progress is often finding those insights and really sticking, sticking by them. So as you think about uh, uh, scaling and what you're working on, a lot of the same principles for how you start apply as you scale as well. All right, number four, metrics. What did he do to, con uh, the question was what did Jonathan do to convince, you wanna take a question now or do you want me to wait? Okay, um, it's your class, you can decide. <laughs> um, uh, what are things uh, Jonathan did to convince me? Um, I, I think mostly he fed my interest in solving this problem. And he's, and uh, you know, there was some piece of it was confidence in, in myself. You know, I, I walked into it saying I don't know anything about the space and he gave me all the examples of all the people that have been uh, successful in the space without knowing it and why he would rather have someone that doesn't know it but has a, an interesting idea for it than, than otherwise. And the other half of it was probably confidence in being able to do it in a, in a big organization. And so, you know, the, there's, uh, he ended up uh, handing me a team of people that were, were sort of cordoned off. And then actually the, turning it into YouTube happened, happened later. Um, we started in a slightly different space. Actually, that project ended up becoming a thing called Chromecast, the little dongles that sit in the back of the TVs. Um, uh, but he sort of addressed both, both of those things. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about metrics a bit. Now, um, and why, why metrics matter. Um, and, and so for, for this story, I, I, uh, it's gonna sort of fast forward time a bit to the 2011, 2012 period. Um, now, I, I call this the wandering period for, for YouTube. Uh, if you think about like 2008 to 2010, uh, we, we kind of had a fire under our ass. And it, it, was, it was very, very clear that not only did the world think we were gonna fail, that Google thought we were gonna fail. Um, and it was not, uh, you know, it was incredibly motivating to get through that process. But now we hit 2011, 2012. Um, we hit a lot of our goals. You know, done a bunch of celebrations. We were we were well past the point of of uh, sustainability. Uh, nobody was talking about shutting us down anymore. Um, and all of a sudden, pace slowed, and it wasn't it wasn't very clear uh, how to how to get it back. Uh, and that that you know that sort of manifested itself in a lot of ways. I think one 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 observation was. Um, uh, we sort of, we had no real competitors, and I think, uh, you know, I, I've managed to work on businesses of lots of different types, ones where in spaces that are incredibly competitive and ones in spaces that are, that are not, ones where you're the leader, ones where you're, where you're the follower. Um, I think everybody thinks that it's much better to be the leader and, and be number one or clear number one in a big, in a, in a market. Um, and I tell you, there's a lot of downsides to that as well. One of the biggest is um, you sort of lose your sense of, of uh, direction. You lose your sense of what, of uh, pace, of motivation. It's actually incredibly motivating to be number two to a fast moving number one. Um, and we were feeling that. Um, and so we were discussing 
you know, what to, what to do about it. Um, and, and two stories uh, came up that, that uh, I thought I'd share before I tell you what we did about it. Um, so, so number one, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to that guy in a second. Uh, so number one was uh, Coca-Cola. So there's this old uh, story uh, about Coca-Cola that they were, they were having a strategy meeting and, and somebody asked, you know, how long are we going to keep going back and forth on, you know, we're 51% share versus Pepsi and 49% or whatever, whatever that, that is. It just doesn't seem like this is ever going to go anywhere. Uh, and somebody said, maybe we're looking at it wrong. Maybe we should measure Coke as percentage of the stomach. Um, and, you know, by that measure, it's like, you know, very small percentage share. Um, and that led to Coke investing in all these other businesses and, uh, and now they sell water and lemonade and all these other, all these other things. Um, and so that was one kind of interesting thing sitting in our head is that maybe we're, you know, we're, we're, YouTube is a clear number one, but maybe we're framing the, framing the market wrong. Um, the, the other one was, uh, was a story of, uh, uh this guy's, uh, this guy named Ben Hunt Davis. And, um, uh, so he was on the, the British, uh, rowing team. And in, uh, the late nineties, this team got together and this is a pretty famous story as well. You can, you can look him up, uh, got together and, um, and uh, decided that they were going to fix things. So this, this rowing team in, in Britain, and you know, uh, rowing is pretty popular there, um, hadn't won a title in, in many, many years, uh, the Olympics or any of the, the, the uh, worldwide championships and so on. And so they got together and they made this decision that they would, make, um, they would make every decision with a single question. And that question was, will it make the boat go faster? Uh, and they're going to sit down and say, you know, should uh, person A or person B in the back be in the back of the boat? They would say, well, all that matters is will it make the boat go faster? They'd say, you know, where should, should we go to dinner at this restaurant or that restaurant? They'd say, well, it doesn't matter um, uh, for any reason other than will it make the boat go faster? And they, they tried to apply this theory and, you know, it has a happy ending. They ended up winning. Um, uh, but these, these two thoughts, um, uh, these two stories really stuck in our heads as we, as we thought about uh, what to do. Um, and and uh, what we ended up doing has something to do with the billion, which is why that guy's up there. Um, the uh, uh, we got together our at our YouTube leadership offsite, um, and we announced uh, two things. So, so number one, we announced uh, a single unifying metric. And we said from now on, uh, you know, our version of will, the, will it make the boat go faster is going to be watch time, and we're going to we're going to make every decision based on whether or not it's going to increase increase watch time. Um, I'll come back to why that's important in a second. Uh, and secondly, we set a goal, and we said we, our goal as a team is to get to a billion hours a day of watch time. Uh, we put a time frame on the goal, but uh, we didn't announce that publicly, so I won't talk about that here. Um, uh, we said we're going we're gonna to get to a billion hours a day of, of watch time. Um, now, just I, I know that probably is a hard number to, to understand, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. At the time, uh, we were doing about 100 million hours a day of watch time, so it's you know, sort of 10x more than where we, where we were at. Um, some of the comparables at the time, you know, uh, Google was in roughly the same ballpark, but it's kind of a dumb metric for Google because the whole point of Google is get on and off the site as fast as possible. Um, uh, there was no other Google property even close, so we were by far the, the largest at Google. Uh, the, in fact, in the, in the rest of the internet, the only property that had more than us was Facebook, uh, and uh, Facebook had about double uh, that amount of watch time at, at the time. And so we set this goal. Um, uh, and said, so these are some of the comparables, but the way to think about it is that uh, television at the time was about five and a half billion hours a day of watch time. So YouTube was about 100 million, uh, television is about five and a half billion hours a day. Uh, and so we said, if we're successful at this goal, um, uh, and w you know, getting to a billion hours a day w seemed crazy, um, we, uh, we would still only be 20% of, of television. So this is sort of our version of 1% of the stomach. Um, and... Uh, you know, so, so a few things about the goal. So first off, it was crazy. My, my, uh, my head of data science got up and, and uh, well, before we announced it and then after we announced it, told me I was crazy, said it's never going to happen, um, uh, certainly not in the time frame I had suggested, and maybe not ever. Um, uh, there was, um, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of very um, interesting implications. Uh, you know, for us to hit that goal, uh, it would mean every team doing something completely differently. Just to give one example, uh, at the time, YouTube streams a lot of, um, obviously streams a lot of video, uses up a lot of the internet's bandwidth. At the time, we were using about 20% of the, of the internet's bandwidth. It's a little bit hard to measure internet's bandwidth, but that was our sort of closest approximation. Um, in order to hit this goal, based on the pace that the internet was growing, the pace that YouTube would have to grow to hit this goal, the net impact would be that we'd be streaming, at a billion hours a day, we'd be streaming roughly double uh, the amount of capacity of the total internet. 
uh, at, the, at the time. So, so the networking team had to get to work. Um, and we kind of went through every team and described what this, what this goal would mean uh, uh, for, for everyone. Now, the, so we made these two announcements. Watch time is going to be our single clarifying metric, and we're going to get to a billion hours a day of, of watch time. Um, a couple things happened out of, uh, out of that announcement. Number one, it greatly clarified decision making. You know, all of a sudden, we would sit down in reviews, and we'd argue about, you know, and I think you'll see this as, as you scale your businesses, one of the characteristics of every business these days is that you have tons and tons of data. And so you sit down and review and you'd say, should we do A or B? And you say, well, you know, this is what it does to views, and this is what it does to revenue, this is what it does to profit, this is what it does to uh, content creators, this is what it does to this content creator versus that one, or this group of users versus that one. Um, and you could argue about it uh, forever. And what, what it meant was uh, um, lots of lack of clarity in uh, decision making. Uh, you know, one, one good example that I like to ask people is, you know, why do you think YouTube had uh, a reputation for being uh, a, a place for short form video? Um, uh, the restrictions on, on, on uploading uh, only 10 minutes of videos, on, uh, 10 minute long videos on YouTube were long gone uh, at that point, and yet YouTube still had that reputation. Um, and the answer was, was very simple. We had trained every algorithm to optimize for views, not watch time. Uh, and so we would go to creators, and they'd say, oh, I built this great uh, one-hour documentary, and I cut it up into five-minute sections because I wanted, I wanted 20 views on it, not uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I wanted 12 views on it instead of, uh, instead of just one. Um, and so we had to retrain ourselves, we had to retrain the marketplace um, and change how we thought about those incentives. The other thing that happened was um, it completely changed pace. Um, and that, that mission got embedded in, in every person on the team. Is actually, if you walked around Google and asked people what YouTube was working on, they said, oh, they got that billion hour thing they're working on. Um, and you could sort of, you, you get Im uh, immediate recognition from, from everybody. Um, and what that meant was not only did pace increase, um, you know, people started suggesting bolder initiatives and all sorts of innovation started happening again. And you got that feeling of a startup again. You got that feeling of what does it feel like when you have a goal, when you have a, uh, when you have a competitor. So the, the reason I, I uh, uh, talk about this one is, you know, I think as you, as you grow, you'll see lots and lots of different metrics. Uh, I think picking a single clarifying metric is really, really hard. Uh, and I would argue most of the business I've been involved in before or after actually have struggled to, to, to do, do this. So I don't mean to imply that it's easy. But the uh, implications of having that are, are, are great both for clarifying decision making and for help, helping people understand the frame of success. You know, what is the shape and size of success uh, that you're aiming for? All right, number five. Uh, let's talk about making decisions. So one, one fun question I like to ask the team is what makes a good decision? And you're going you're to be in these roles, you're scaling all these, uh, scaling these businesses, what, what is a, what's a good decision? And uh, you know, typical answers I would hear back are, you know, a good decision is one that's made quickly. Um, that's the, probably the most common one. Uh, another would be a good decision is one that's made with all the right people's input. Um, uh, my, my view of it is actually not, neither of those questions is a very good one for whether it's good decisions. I think there's a single question for whether you've made good decisions, and that is, did that decision stick? Um, that's what the duct tape is for. Uh, it's the best metaphor I could come up with. Um, the, uh, uh, so decisions that stick. So I, I wanted to tell uh, uh, a story um, from, this is from the early days of uh, uh, my time at YouTube. So this is in the 2008, 2009 period. Uh, one of the product managers had a suggestion, said, um, I think we should uh, link out to other video websites. And the, the typical example is you come to YouTube, this back in, in that time frame, you come to YouTube and you search for Modern Family, which is a popular show at the time, still is. Um, and on YouTube, you get a bunch of garbage. Uh, and if you went to Google, you'd get links to watch Modern Family um, on other properties. You get it on ABC, you get it on Hulu, wherever else. And um, this person's argument was really simple and compelling. He says, hey, we're YouTube. We're owned by this company called Google. Our job is to give people answers. We should give them the answer they're asking for. So they come to us and say, where do I watch Modern Family? We should tell them. And we should direct them to those, to those places. Um, pretty compelling argument. Um, uh, of course, we didn't end up doing it, which I think everybody knows. Um, uh, and let me explain why. So there were, a bunch of, um, there were a bunch of business people in the room who said, oh, if you do that, it's going to confuse our content partnerships in all these different ways. And those people were mostly ignored. Um, that's not how we made, uh, made those kind of decisions. Um, but then somebody brought up this uh, different argument. They said, hey, uh, let's uh, use the analogy of uh, Amazon and Google product search. Um, by any sort of logical conclusion, Google product search should have kicked Amazon's butt. Uh, you know, Google product search is a full superset of Amazon. So why would you ever go to Amazon and look for a product when you could come to Google product search and find everything on Amazon and everything everywhere else on the internet? Seems like a really sound thesis. Was completely wrong. Um, now why is that? 
And in fact, you could apply the same argument to uh, you know, Google Video and, and, and YouTube. And the fact that Google had to go purchase uh, YouTube when, when they had a great Google Video property is, is telling as well. Same pattern, Google Video search indexed all of YouTube. So it had everything on YouTube plus the rest of the internet. But, but, the, uh, uh, but the net impact was that the, the narrower uh, property actually won. And we came to this conclusion that in certain markets, consistency beats comprehensiveness. Um, and you know, in Amazon's case, that's uh, that's easy to describe, right? The, uh, you know, why do you go to Amazon instead of elsewhere on the internet? Well, you know, you get a you get a consistent experience for for buying a product. You understand how the reviews work. Uh, you know how shipping works. You know how returns work, uh, and all of those things actually trump the fact that they might be missing something. Um, and basically, uh, the same thing was happening in the video space, and we believe that was going to going to continue. Probably a separate discussion about whether this applies to our market, all markets or not. Uh, but we were quite convinced that it applied uh, to video. So we made the decision, and we didn't add uh, external links uh, to YouTube. Now, the the importance of that story is, uh, you know, it, it, of course, the decision stuck because it's still not those links on on, on YouTube. Uh, but the the real importance of that story is the implications it had on future decisions. Um, so as an example, the next thing that happened was we went and uh, at the time we had a bunch of embedded video players on YouTube, we went and pulled all of those off. Um, the, the next thing after that was uh, the um, uh, team came to us and said, we'd like to remove an option. At the time, we were giving uh, video uploaders the option to decide whether videos were shown on mobile devices or not. Uh, we said, we'd like to remove that option. If we're, gonna, if we're willing to sacrifice the size of our corpus in order to have a more consistent experience, then shouldn't the same principle apply? We should be willing to, uh, we should be willing to uh, take the set of people that, that don't want their videos on every device and say, you can go host it somewhere else. Um, similarly, we did the same thing on, on uh, interface. At the time, uh, you, uh, YouTube, uh, the only property we built for YouTube was actually the web page. Uh, every other YouTube experience was built by that manufacturer. So, you know, the, the Xbox team built their experience, and the, each of the TV manufacturers built their experience, and, uh, you know, Apple built their experience, and so on. The Apple one is probably the, the one that's been uh, talked about the most. We had to go through a very tough negotiation. Uh, since Apple had been building the YouTube experience since the very first iPhone, and pulling it off, that meant a lot of implications, including not being default installed on the iPhone, uh, which, seemed, which seemed crazy at the time. Um, but we went and made that decision as well. So we'd, we'd rather have a consistent experience across all devices, and we'd sacrifice, we'd sacrifice distribution in order to do it. Um, so, so the reason I mention is you'll, you'll find yourself in these, in these roles, and you'll make you know, thousands of different decisions. You make them all, all the time. Uh, and and it, it's often hard to figure out uh, what are good decisions. And my, my main lesson was the, the best decision is not only the one um, I get made quickly and so on, but rather the one that, that sticks. Um, that makes it easier to make the next 10 decisions, or in the very best case, it actually obviates the need for the next 10 decisions because everybody already understands the principle of what you're trying to get done. All right, number six, ecosystems. Um, anyone know who this guy is? All right, little hint, his name is Bauer. Now, does anybody know who this guy is? I think I, all right, somebody knew. All right, so he's, uh, one of those guys. Um, the the uh, uh, actually the song behind one of those guys. I'm going to turn that off because that's disturbing. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about ecosystems. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about the music ecosystem. Um, so the music ecosystem and YouTube have uh, a very symbiotic relationship. So um, uh, you know the the music industry really needs YouTube. Um, uh, if you go look at a bunch of different reports, you know Nielsen will tell you that that people under a certain age tend to use YouTube for music more than the terrestrial radio. Um, so the, the, the music industry has, has uh, very much aligned with uh, figuring out how to make this YouTube thing work. Um, the same was true in reverse. For YouTube, music is a very popular uh, genre. Uh, but even more importantly, if you upload a video to uh, YouTube that has music in it, um, it actually, you know, we would license that on your behalf um, and uh, share the revenue back with the music labels. The, uh, uh, so that meant not only did, did we have to uh, uh, deal with uh, Taylor Swift's music video, we had to deal with the birthday party video that had Taylor Swift in the background. Um, so this was a really important symbiotic relationship. Um, now, uh, which meant that the negotiations were always really tough, and they would happen about every three or four years. So in 2011, we were going through our set of negotiations for, with the music labels, uh, spent an all-day session uh, talking through lots of different things, and then afterwards, we went out for, uh, went out for drinks, uh, and I happened to be sitting uh, next to one of, the, one of the other label executives, and I asked him this question. I said, I, I just want to know, uh, 
you know, that we just came out of a day-long, very adversarial meeting, said, when is, this, when is that tone going to change? When is, uh, uh, and the way I phrased the question was, when is it going to be the case that your uh, relationship with YouTube and your ability to be successful on YouTube actually helps you win clients? Right, the, the, you know, the way uh, a label works is they have to convince artists to, to join their label. Generally, the way they, the, the, and historically, the way they used to convince them was, hey, we have relationships with all the record stores. And then over time, it became we have a relationship with all the radio DJs. Um, and I wanted to know, when's it going to be the case that you say, you should, uh, you should be signed by me because I know how to make you successful on, on YouTube. Um, and, uh, and I threw out some hypotheses. I said, is it going to be like a certain amount of revenue? Is it like a, you know, a certain percentage of an artist's revenue has to come from YouTube? Um, is it going to be a, a certain amount of viewership, like that it has to reach a certain scale? Um, and he kind of laughed and said, uh, no, 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 it's not any of those things. He said, you probably don't want to know the answer. I said, no, I want to know the answer. Um, and he said, I'll tell you, it's one thing. This is, you know, the artist don't really, the revenue piece is uh, not really that important because uh, one, of the, one of the secrets of the music industry is that most of the money is actually not made on any of these distribution channels. It's mostly made in touring. Um, so most of these artists actually are not, are not that motivated by the revenue coming out of these channels. Um, uh, and viewership, so similarly, they just don't think that way. But there's one thing that they are obsessed with. Every, every artist you can think of is obsessed with where they stand on the billboard charts. Um, and you know the revenue goes up or down. This guy, this guy was telling me I never get a call from anybody. But if you know if an artist drops from number two to number four on the charts, you know he's on the phone immediately. What 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 are you doing to fix this? Um, and I said, oh boy, that's kind of interesting. So we go go home, go to bed, wake up, say get together with the team. And said, so what are we going to do with this negotiation? So we proposed this idea. I said, what what would it take for for Billboard to actually use YouTube data as a as a signal in in its rankings? And uh, so we asked, has anybody called Billboard? I said, nope, nobody thought to call, call Billboard. Um, so we said, all right, well, maybe we should call Billboard. Maybe, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll, like, you know, negotiate a deal with us and let us, let us do it. So we called Billboard, and, um, you know, not surprisingly in retrospect, although surprisingly to us at the time, they were super excited about it. And they said, of course we'd like to do it. We, we like to report on whatever's popular. YouTube seems to be where, where people are listening to music. Uh, we'd be happy to do it. Um, and they said, what, what do you want to charge us for your data? And we said, uh, well, are you kidding? Like, we thought we'd have to pay you to give you the data. Um, and, uh, and they said, no, 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 OK, fine. So we, we decided to, to, to do it for free, and we're going we're gonna to send them all the data. So we start this project to send them all the data. Uh, they're actually, their biggest question was, how the hell are we going to deal with all that data? Um, so they wanted us to synthesize it in a whole bunch of different ways um, uh, to make it manageable for them. Uh, and so we start this project, and then we get a call from them uh, just a few weeks before launch, and they said, um, hey, we'd like to launch a little bit early. And uh, this was like four weeks before the launch. And we said, in my history of all these partnerships, I'd never heard of a you know, partner wanting to launch early. I said, okay, what, you know, why? And they said, well, we really can't tell you, uh, but we'd like, to, we'd like to launch like tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and we said, all right, well, uh, you, know, you have the data. It's up to you. Uh, go ahead and launch tomorrow. Uh, and we found out the next day why. Um, and the, the reason was that this guy, Bauer, ended up at number one on the charts. Uh, and this was particularly interesting because um, you know, the, at the time, Billboard had been around for, I think, 57 years. And they'd never had an unknown unsigned, unsigned artist debut at number one. So he had, you know, he had no label, and he'd never been on the chart before, and he started at, at, at number one. Uh, and for us, it was particularly interesting because if you actually went and looked at his views on YouTube, none of them were on anything he uploaded. This was, you know, this is the types of stuff you would see. I guess it's too fuzzy here to see it. Um, uh, because people were taking a song and making, you know, all these kind of videos. Um, uh, and, and so that, 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 was, uh, that, that was really interesting to us. The, the long-term impacts of that were, were enormous. I mean, it's, uh, it's still the case that uh, uh, YouTube has now become a, a primary um, uh, vehicle for musicians. And artists now invest a lot of energy into their, their music viewership, often at the cost of, uh, of other things, partially because of, of the decision we made uh, to share our data with, with, with Billboard. Um, and, you know, the, I think the lesson here is every business operates in an ecosystem. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how big you are. There's, somebody, there's, there's sets of people that you, you need to rely on. And it's very easy to presume something about their incentives uh, if you don't ask. And so uh, what I'd suggest is don't presume. Go out, collect the data, ask the real hard questions, and you might find something completely counterintuitive uh, like we did here. All right. Let's talk about values. Let me switch to my. All right, so uh, we're going to talk a bit about value. So as you um, as you scale, uh, one of the things that'll matter a lot is is your your sense of values. 
The uh, story I want to tell here is from September 11, 2012. Um, so September 11, 2012, we get a call um, saying, hey, there's been something terrible happened. Uh, there was an attack on the U.S. Embassy in Libya, and uh, um, the uh, U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Chris Stevens, had been, had been killed. Um, and uh, the reason we got the call was uh, the world was convinced that it had to do with this video, that this was a, a series of protesters that were protesting uh, a video called Innocence of Muslims. Um, and uh, everyone wanted to know what we were going to do about it. Uh, you know, every government, every journalist, everybody wanted to know what we were going to do about it. And uh, so, uh, and, and there, were, there, there was uh, sort of compelling arguments on, on both sides. There was a series of people um, who, you know, really, really wanted to take the video down. Right? There's the, you know, it's just, it's just stupid video. Um, you know, just, just take it down if it can help save even one person's, uh, one person's life. Um, and there was, you know, uh, a lot of growing, you know, every hour we were getting called saying, hey, there's been another protest in a different country and they got the same thing happening now in Yemen, happening in Egypt, and it was kind of spreading through the region. Um, and, and so there was a set, uh, set of arguments that way. On the other hand, our policy team could find nothing wrong with the video. Um, they couldn't find any reason for, for us to pull it down. Uh, and, and so they were sort of staunchly arguing that we should, uh, we should leave it alone. And the next 24 hours were really tough. Um, uh, and I got probably, uh, I think, one of the best, uh, best short-term educations possible on how to think about the laws uh, across the world for freedom of speech, hate speech, and, and incitement of violence, which is really the, the, the intersection of those laws is what, what, uh, uh, what really had to be figured out uh, in, this, in this case. Now, um, you know, the, the uh, net impact is the video actually stayed up except for a few select countries. Um, but thankfully, it, it was also determined that the video actually didn't have anything to do with the, uh, with the assassination of the, of the ambassador. Uh, now Hillary Clinton gets to go deal with the rest of that. Um, uh, I got to at the time. Um, uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, but, the, you know, the, the, the reason uh, I think this is an important lesson for, for this group is, uh, you know, these days as these properties... Um, and businesses get, uh, get bigger and bigger, we're, we're sort of in an uh, interesting spot where the, the level of impact these uh, companies and, and products can have is kind of unprecedented. I mean, if you think about that situation we were in, um, we were the last decider. Like, whether this thing stayed up or down, um, there was no government that could force us to do anything. There was no group to go to. There was no judge to, to make a real call on it. We were going to decide, and, and, you know, we had to be ready, uh, ready to do it. And I think one of the things to think about as you scale, you know, hopefully if you get to the point of uh, working in a business that has uh, that level of impact, it also comes with an enormous amount of responsibility. And you have to think about your values in advance so that by the time you get hit by this, you know uh, you have some frame in which to make those decisions. All right. I'm going to switch gears talking about people. Go ahead. Sorry, quickly. Mm -hmm. In terms of like how values of life is scaling, mm -hmm. um, I mean, how do you deal, though, with like situations where, for example, going into China, such a huge market opportunity, but they're very tough about how they want to pull it off or, you know, other countries that have very different understandings of freedom of speech. I mean, how can you leave like, so, like such huge businesses, like such a huge part of business on the table? Yeah, so the question was roughly, um, uh, how could you leave China on the table? Um, just, just so, so my, my perspective on that was, um, uh, well, there's, there's two parts. One, it wasn't really a choice. I mean, there, was, there, wasn't, there wasn't really, uh, for, for YouTube in particular, and I think someone else should probably speak to the Google piece of that, uh, but for YouTube in particular, there was no choice. There was no, there was no real opportunity to, to go into China. Um, I tried many different tactics of, of, of ways to do it. Um, but there just wasn't a practical way, uh, way to do it. Uh, in my opinion, I, I would have done it. Um, and in fact, we did launch in a number of, actually through uh, experiences like that, we launched YouTube in all sorts of countries where we didn't really agree with quite their way of, uh, of doing business or, or, of, uh, or the form of government. Um, because uh, you know, the trade uh, and the way I, I would uh, uh, recommended was I, I believe that allowing people to express themselves um, uh, even small amounts was was better than than not being in the region at all. Um, but for China in particular, I, it, it, was, it ended up being kind of a moot question. Yeah. All right, let's switch to talking about people. So 
you know, picked the right table to sit at, you figured out the right uh, values, you figured out the right uh, thesis you want to invest in. Um, now you need a crew, you need a set of people that are actually going to help you get this done. Uh, and so I picked off a few things to uh, talk about in terms of how to, um, you know, judge talent, uh, how, to, how to work with them yourself, and then um, and how to organize them. Uh, so let's talk first off on, on, on judging talent. Um, and so I'll, I'll walk through this, this framework in a second just to, just to introduce it, um, uh, some context. This is a um, framework that was given to me by, by an old boss uh, for how to think about comparing, uh, comparing people, uh, generally framed in the, the notion of how do you tell a difference between someone who's senior and someone who's junior. Um, we applied this at Google across a bunch of different functions. Um, you know, it's being used for how uh, the uh, product management promotion committees, for example, compare uh, different levels of product managers. And generally the question there was phrased as, what's the, what's the difference between a level three and a level six product manager, or a level three and a level six engineer? And those terms, you don't have to worry about the numbers, just uh, you can reframe that as, what does it mean to be a, a junior product manager versus a senior product manager, or so on. Um, and so, uh, so we, we thought about it in these two axes. Uh, so one axis um, uh, that would generally get referred to as scope. And we'd say, okay, the way you should compare people is, you know, junior people uh, would start off and they'd work on features, and then they'd gradually work on groups of features, and eventually they'd work on, you know, areas of a product, and then they'd cover a whole product, and then they'd cover multiple different products, and, and that's, you know, that's how you should judge junior versus senior is the scope of the thing that, they're, that they've got uh, ownership for. Um, we proposed a, a slightly different axis for, for looking at this with, with an acronym that is, uh, it does not make a word at all. Um, uh, with P-S-H-E, um, so it stands for uh, problem, solution, how, execution. So I'll walk it from the, from the bottom up. So uh, you start off as a uh, uh, you know, junior employee, um, someone hands you a problem, someone hands you the rough solution and says this is how we're going to solve the problem. They, they, send you, they give you a list of how, a list of instructions. They say, well, what you should do is you should go meet this person, you should assemble this group, you should write this document, and these are the things you have to do uh, in order to, to implement the solution. And the job of the person is to go execute. Go follow these instructions and that's, that's the job. And then gradually that person becomes a little more senior and gets handed a problem and gets handed a solution, but now that person has to figure out the how, figure out who to talk to, how to set, set up the team, uh, what the cadence should be, whatever, whatever, the, whatever that might mean. Um, and then at the, at the next stage, the person becomes a little more senior, gets handed a problem with no solution. The job of the person is to go figure out the solution. And at some point in, in that person's career, um, they're handed a space uh, and they have to come back and tell you what the problems are uh, and decide, decide where to focus on. Um, so, so this is this is a progression we we use to think about how to evaluate people a lot. Um, you, know, you could put you could put different labels on this axis. You know, one people like to call it leadership. Um, uh, I like to use the term training wheels. Uh, in fact, the way I like to to phrase this is, uh, if you were to put the two axes together, is to say, given this person, what's the biggest scope you could hand this person with no training wheels? Um, you know, sort of what how what amount of support do they need? Uh, to, to get started. Now there's a couple uh, sort of counterintuitive things about this. So, so one was the, the path that people generally took in evolving through these stages um, generally wasn't linear. Uh, in fact, what would generally happen is early in people's career, they would be uh, sort of growing by growing scope. And at some point, the curve would uh, turn almost completely the other direction, and it would be less about the scope and more about some of the, the mechanisms of how they did the job, and then gradually it would turn back uh, at the top. And um, this period in the middle, I, I call this the, the trough of disillusionment. Um, and you know, put it in terms of like a promotion committee. So you're you're sitting there, you're trying to decide this level three person is level six person. You know, how do you tell the difference? Um, and you know, the way I would I would phrase it is the difference between a level three person, and level six person had nothing to do with scope. They could they could be doing the same job. Uh, it was much more about how they did the job than the job they did, um, which makes it much much harder to evaluate how 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 good a job they're doing. Um, but this frame of thinking about how people grow was very helpful in, in trying to figure out, and I, I, we use this across disciplines, um, uh, trying to figure out you know, what, what, uh, what does success really look like and how do people grow through it. Um, a, a second tool I, uh, I want to talk about is something we use called Dream Teams. And th this tool, the, the basic idea here is really simple. We would um, uh, take groups of people and uh, we'd ask a single question. The question was, if you were, um, who would you hire first if you were starting this team from scratch? 
Uh, we used to call it the dream team question. We used to ask it in a whole bunch of different ways. We'd ask uh, uh, managers for their teams. We'd ask peers for their, uh, you know, people on on their um, on their collective teams, and so on, uh, and try to try to form a view on on what uh, what the dream teams were. And then we take that list, uh, and we would generally draw three lines. Um, so the first line is. Uh, I call it the awesome bar. So those are the set of people you, you sort of build a team around. Um, at the other end of the spectrum was the, we probably wouldn't have hired this person again bar. Um, and then there was a middle line that I called the hiring bar. Um, and just to explain each one. So the, the top one, uh, well actually let's start on the other end. The, the wouldn't hire again bar. Um, the, uh, first off, there was no like set place to draw that bar. It was entirely qualitative. Like you could, you could draw that bar and say there's nobody underneath that. You could draw the bar and put the whole team underneath that. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 uh, the exercise was to be intellectually honest with how you, how you feel about the, about the, the team. And, uh, and there's a set of steps we would take when, when people were, were under that bar. Um, the, I'll, I'll come back in just a second. The, uh, at the other end of the spectrum was uh, uh, the awesome bar. Uh, and that's really where you want to invest your time. So you take those set of people, um, you spend your time talking about them, you spend your time making sure they feel like they're valued, make sure that they are working on challenging things. We would rotate them through teams regularly to try and make sure that they were getting exposed to new areas of product, getting challenged in different ways. The one in the middle, the hiring bar, was sort of interesting too. It's very natural in an organization to set your hiring bar at the same place as the wouldn't hire again bar. I, I, you know, we need, we need somebody to replace Joe, so just get me somebody that's better than Joe. And it's a, it's a very natural organizational instinct to say, or it's, the other way it gets phrased is, well, we hired that person, um, and that, this other person seems just about as good, so we should just uh, do the same thing. Um, and so we would set the hiring bar, and the, the, the YouTube hiring committees actually had a list of people. And so it wasn't a list of, just a list of quality. So it wasn't, you know, they can write code this fast, or they can, you know, design at the speed, or whatever, whatever it might, uh, you know, whatever synthetic metrics you might, uh, you might come up with, we would say, hey, we've decided our hiring bar is, is way up here, and we'd like, to, as you evaluate candidates, we'd like you to think about these four or five frames of reference of people we think are emblematic of, uh, of, those, of those capabilities. Um, and there's lots of tactics there to uh, talk about if people, people are interested in. Um, but the, the, the main lessons uh, I, I wanted to uh, express is, uh, you know, you can pick whichever tools you like. If you like those two tools, then, then go ahead. You can pick different ones. Uh, but thinking about the ways you're going to uh, judge people, you know, for example, uh, this, this, this way of judging um, has perspective. You know, there's, there's many leaders who would pick a very different set of things that they would order. Um, this, is, this is my perspective on how, how I think uh, about people grow, how people grow, and it was reflected in the team. Um, and, and there were leaders that had a different set, of, like you could almost express it as my, my set of values. Um, and then thinking about how you want to manage that across your team and make sure that the, the, you're spending your energy on the top of your team, uh, not on your bottom, is, a, is a, a really hard thing to do, but a very important thing to do. Go ahead, what's your question? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding it correctly. Yeah. So who would you hire first, and then mm -hmm. the, the three lines thing, are they yeah. separate exercises? No, no, same exercise. So you, you, you build your list, you say, who would I hire first, and you, you sort of end up with a, an ordered list of people, right. and then you draw lines within that list. So we would do it every quarter, um, and so we do it on a time cadence. But I, uh, sorry, I should be repeating the question. So the, the, the question was, uh, what's the cadence for doing it? We, we would do it every quarter. So uh, and I, I actually think that doing it more frequently is actually better. Uh, and if you have the right tools for doing it, it you, you can do it pretty, pretty quickly. Um, go ahead, question there. The uh, question was, do you fire anyone based on it? So uh, I was in the luxurious position of being at a company um, that uh, people fought like crazy to get into. Um, so generally speaking, people that were below that, that bottom line, uh, once they were told that they were below that line, uh, they generally made the right choices. Um, so that, you know, the, this is uh, not a rule I would apply everywhere. I've been in situations where that's, that's not true. Um, but that, that was sort of the, the, the notion of uh, how it worked for us. Um, but in some cases, absolutely we did. I mean, I, I think that's the... Uh, I think building the building that muscle into how you think about uh, uh, your top and bottom is is uh, is a part of making sure the only way to make sure you have a healthy team is to treat your top very well and make sure that uh, your bottom doesn't stay along for very long. All right, uh, let's talk about your roles. Now you're leading this team. 
Um, there's lots of different things to uh, talk about as your role changes. You become a manager, you become a manager, manager. At some point, you're running a bunch of functions, many functions where you don't actually understand what they do. Um, lots of different things to talk about there. I, I picked one to talk about, which is how to be a bad manager. Um, and I'll come back to why that implies something about being a good manager. I, I think there's three ways to be a bad manager. Um, so, so one is uh, the one that's most typically talked about is being a micromanager. And the, that's a sort of easy example to understand is somebody comes to you with a problem and you take the problem from them and you solve it. Um, uh, and the, you know, the downsides of that are, I think are well understood. I, I think another one is uh, another pattern as what I call dictators. Um, and you, you tend to see this uh, a lot more in sales organizations. Um, so the, the, you know, the story I would uh, tell is uh, you know, you're the, the, the sales leader is sitting down with their, with their sales rep uh, and sales rep comes in and says, uh, all right, I had a $10 million quota uh, this quarter, but I just wanted to let you know, uh, you know, I had two major customers uh, in that quota, and, you know, one of them, um, you know, the company went bankrupt, uh, and the other one, you know, the, the, the head of the company passed away, um, and I just wanted to let you know. And the, the sales manager sits there and says, you know, I, I, I kind of blanked out for a second, and I may not have heard everything, but are you, are you still bringing me $10 million this quarter or not? Um, and that, that's sort of the... The, uh, the spirit of uh, those types of leaders. Um, there's a third one. Uh, I call these the, the over-empathizers. Um, and this person is slightly different than, than either of those. So that person, you, you know, employee brings a problem, and uh, manager sits, listens very carefully, doesn't take the problem from them, but, but uh, spends all their energy trying to debug the problem with them says, oh, tell me more about it. What's the, you know, is it, maybe it's because of this, maybe it's because of that, uh, and, and so on. And, and that may seem like a, a, a really good thing to do, but one of the implications of that is now you've taken, you've taken the responsibility off of that person and onto, onto yourself. Uh, and the, the, the main lesson of this is, I, I think everybody has their natural tendency, um, and you probably all know where your natural tendency is. Mine, by the way, is at the top. Uh, and any team I work with, I make sure they know that. That's, that's uh, uh, you know, uh, where, I, where I end up in. Uh, if, um, uh, if pushed, uh, and I think being a good manager is actually not about being, not being any one of these things, it's about being, being able to be these things when, when you need to be. Uh, and sometimes the, the right thing to do is to be a dictator, sometimes the right thing to do is be a micromanager, sometimes the right thing to do is empathize, uh, but understanding which one you naturally are and stretching yourself into the other ones uh, is really important. And, you know, and one way to think about it is the goal of the manager is set inspiring goals, coach when needed, and hold people accountable. And those, those can often be at odds with each other. All right, one last one. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to organize teams. Uh, and again, lots of different things we could talk about there. Yeah, how do you organize functions? How do you organize projects? How do you, do you move people around? Do you not? Uh, so on this one principle that I found we used all the time, um, and it, it's told with a, with a story. So the story is this guy uh, walks up to these three workers and uh, asks them what they're working on. And the, the first one says, hey, I'm, I'm responsible for taking bricks. I take bricks from over there, and I put them over there. And then he goes to the second guy and says, what are you working on? And he says, oh, I'm responsible for laying bricks. So I take those bricks, and I put, them, I put the mortar, and I stick them on top of each other, uh, and that, that's what I do. And he goes to the third guy, and he says, what, what are you responsible for? And he says, well, I'm, I'm here to build a cathedral. Um, and this difference, uh, I think, is really critical as you think about how you set up uh, projects and teams. And ho hopefully the lesson is clear. You know, people that are working on a cathedral, sort of similar to the purpose uh, stuff we talked about at the beginning, the people working on a, on a cathedral have a you know, higher sense of purpose, uh, better, uh, better set of perspective on what they're doing, uh, and, and so on. So when we first talked about this at, at YouTube, uh, we talked about it on offsite, and, and someone asked for an example. So um, just to give you the example, we uh, asked one of the managers in the team to stand up, uh, and uh, this manager stands up, and I said, so uh, explain to everybody else what, you, what you're responsible for. Uh, and that person said, oh, I run the related videos team. I said, okay, what's the related videos team? Well, our job is, you know, when you come to a uh, uh, watch a YouTube video, there's all those videos, like on the right side of the uh, watch page. Our job is to pick which videos go there. Uh, and I asked everybody around the room, which did that sound like? Did that sound like laying bricks? Did that sound like uh, building a cathedral? Um, and that led to a conversation where that team's goal was, uh, was, was reframed and, and broadened. Uh, and we changed how we thought about, uh, about that experience. So the, the, but the main lesson uh, I would give is, as you think about organizing teams uh, and, and setting up goals, what, it's one of the hardest things to do, uh, but the question to be asked is, when you look at each person and look at their team and you kind of work your way through the organization, is how connected do people feel to a cathedral? And do they describe it as a cathedral or do they describe it as, as laying bricks? 
So those are uh, 10 hopefully interesting uh, stories, uh, some about how to you know, pick things that have high tailwinds, pick things where you have a high sense of purpose. Uh, you know, as you execute, look for, look for those theses, look for that thing that you believe that not everybody else believes. Uh, try to find that unifying metric, try to make decisions that stick. Um, look hard at your ecosystem to find uh, non uh, counterintuitive uh, patterns. Think about your values before, before, they're, before they're tested. And as you're building up your team, think about the ways you want to uh, think about talent and measure them, uh, what type of manager you are, and how to structure your team around cathedrals, not just projects. So can you say a little bit more about um, what that, uh, you said there sort of mentioned there were two main periods at YouTube. So there was the mm -hmm. period of, there was a fire lit under you and everyone thought you, was, you were going to fail. Mm -hmm. And then there was the sort of period of wandering that sort of followed after that. Yeah. Um, describe what things were like at the beginning of the period you were gonna fail. Do you have, I mean, how big was the team? What was the area of focus, um, and how close was you, were you still to the founding essence of what YouTube was? So, um, so just because I think I think I would probably describe YouTube as I'd probably say there's probably four phases. So there was the the founding phase mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, mainly before YouTube was purchased, um, and it's before I joined the team. So I know a lot of it uh, only secondhand. Um, uh, after the purchase, the the dynamics changed. Um, and uh, uh, then there was what I call the wandering period. And then I think the, the phase that YouTube is currently in, which I would call acceleration. Right. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, actually I think that, that seems to be going incredibly well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, so I can talk about sort of the, the, uh, the last three, the, the, the first one's a little bit different. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, and YouTube is a, a very unique case. I don't know that a lot of businesses go through this kind of dip. Um, uh, but but YouTube got you know on one side was an enormous success you know bought bought for 1.6 billion dollars at mm -hmm. the time uh, seemed like a lot of money before a whole bunch of other acquisitions <laughs> got done um, and uh, you know it was a was a very popular property and so on um, uh, but we were you know our, our backs were to the wall I mean it was uh, it was a very common conversation of could this be shut down could it be spun out mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a it wasn't a foregone conclusion that YouTube would be allowed to continue. Uh, going through this, but just to, I, I'll tell one story to help people understand what that what that felt like. Um, so we were, let's see, this was uh, must have been like October 18th or 19th. It was uh, three or four days after my second daughter was born. Uh, I go into work, which my wife was not help, happy about, um, and uh, meet with Patrick Bichette, who's our CFO uh, uh, at the time. This is sort of my first meeting with him. Uh, you know, I had joined YouTube about a month earlier, and he had three charts in front of him. Uh, and he was, he was totally ready for this meeting. Um, and one was, uh, here's, how, uh, here's how much money YouTube is losing per year. And it was a lot of money. Uh, second one was, here's how much money YouTube is losing per view. Uh, and uh, that was not, uh, that was a, um, a, enough money. And, the, and then there was a third one that said, here's what views are doing. And, and views weren't doing this, they were doing this. Right? And, it, and he said, this is, this is the worst business on the planet. I mean, th this is, as, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about negative gross margin businesses and, and so on. You know, we were like the, the, the worst. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I would say uh, on one side, it was incredibly focusing. I mean, every, everybody completely understood uh, what needed to be done and anything which meant across all functions. It, it, it meant, you know, obviously the monetization team was under a lot of pressure to find some way to, to you know, create an ad unit and so on, some of the stuff I talked about. Uh, but it also meant things like, you know, the networking team was shaving costs as fast as possible and the content team was constantly renegotiating and rethinking how, how we dealt with uh, content licenses. And, you know, the, the viewership team was thinking about creative ways to build, rebuild, the, rebuild the experience uh, around, this, uh, around this goal. Uh, so it was, it was very clarifying. So I would say at that time, the sentiment would be intense. It would be intense, but um, uh, you'd make resolutions fast, and you'd and you'd go do them. Uh, I'd say that wandering period was tough because it, it, it you know all of a sudden uh, it, it was kind of like we uh, uh, we went from this uh, like totally nimble small company to feeling very big all of a sudden. This is you know how do you pick between doing project A or project B? Well, they're all going to move us forward. They all seem good, so you know everything gets funded, everything kind of moves, um, which kind of mean not, nothing moves. It meant uh, all the projects kind of intersect each other. All of a sudden, people are working on things that 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 uh, uh, that don't have alignment. You know, one one of the ways I like to describe it is, is you know in a in a healthy um, in a healthy dynamic, 
uh, you know, somebody brings up a new project and says, hey, I want to do, uh, you know, you're working on A, I'm working on B, I want to do, pro the, here's project C. Um, you know, in healthy dynamic, you know, both A and B, first off, they're too busy to even do it. So, the, you know, the healthy dynamic is we're already racing, you know, the, you know, the, the Jonathan Rosenberg used to do the analogy of, like, I'm going to drop this ball in the middle of the table. In a healthy dynamic, the, the ball should drop on the floor, right? It's a, the, I should have to force people to go, go do the new thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when somebody picks it up, everybody is super supportive because that, that's the, yep. the, the nature of that business is going. Uh, and I would say for temporarily that, that, that changed. Mm -hmm. And I think we managed to change it back, but it was, uh, you know, it wasn't easy. Got it. Yeah. So in, in that, pe that period at the beginning when you were making the big uh, push to get the cost down, get the revenue up and so mm. forth and turn YouTube into an effective business, mm. what were key org changes you had to make in order to make that successful? I mean, I would say the, the organization actually didn't matter a ton. I think the people mattered a lot. Um, and so I would say, uh, uh, and we were pretty um, active on that. I mean, the, the tolerance for a not stellar person in a role was incredibly low then, right? It was, uh, you know, we moved people out of positions incredibly fast just because we, we couldn't, we didn't have time to, to, to wait to see if something was going to work out. If it was, it was clear that person wasn't working, uh, uh, we moved fast. Uh, and on the other side, we pulled in, you know, the best help from anywhere we could. And sometimes that was, uh, um, Sometimes, actually, you know, one, one interesting story is the guy who, so I was I told the story about TrueView, this ad format. I, I was mentioning it took a long time to, to actually get it shipped, took almost three years to get it shipped. Um, so a lot of actually what we did to write the ship was, uh, was done without it. Um, the, uh, that project actually got shelved. I couldn't, I couldn't get it through the sales team. Um, and so, so we didn't launch it for a while. And I, there was a guy on the sales team who really, really wanted to be a product manager. Um, and he was really smart. And so we decided to give him a shot, but we couldn't move him over. And so I said, here's the deal. I'll let you do it in your 20% time as long as you keep doing your current job um, and you have to take this project that, that's gotten shelved and, and I really want to see it, right. see it work. And so I think you got, we got really creative about how to, yeah. how to get the right people and the right problems because you're sort of motivated the right direction. Got it. And what you mentioned earlier when you, when you were talking <clears throat> about how valuable having that single target metric mm -hmm. um, was for the entire organization. Um, What's the process you put in place for company communications? I mean, one of the things which just really changes as a company sort of grows mm -hmm. is the way in which you talk to the staff as a whole. So that very clarifying meeting you had with the yeah. CFO, yeah. how did you communicate that effectively to the team? And how was that different than in the future when you came up with that one metric? Uh, so I, I'm a big believer in... Um I mean, there's a lot of different communication forums, and we used to do uh, a lot of the ones I think are, these days are pretty standard across companies. We do the TGIFs, and you do Q&As, and so on. Um, I, was, I was a pretty big believer in writing a weekly mail. Uh, and uh, actually, as a general sentiment, I think, uh, which I didn't talk about here, but I'd say leaders that write things down, I think, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons to write or not write things down, but I think leaders that write things down uh, um, uh, tend to deal with less communication issues. Uh, it, and I, I would say, it, it's, to say it differently, writing it down generally meant you had to clarify your thought process in a completely different way. I mean, the, the, it's, it's very easy to leave a meeting with, uh, okay, we decided this thing, everyone go tell your teams and they'll tell their teams and they'll tell uh, their teams. And first off, you don't actually, everybody doesn't quite know what was decided. And so if you didn't write it down, and then secondly, you're gonna play this game of telephone of, you know, I wasn't there, but the person who was there told, said that this thing happened and, right. and, and so on. Um, so I used to send a, a weekly YouTube all mail um, that would go uh, go to everyone. Uh, Robert would do something very similar, um, and we would uh, lay out. Some of it was updates. You know, here's things that happened, and generally we try to pick something like we made this hard decision. And we want people to understand why, um, and I think that was pretty effective at uh, at communicating things like that. You had a question? Um, yeah. So let's yeah. actually go ahead, please. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier in the talk that yeah. Sal Khan couldn't have been able to create his business three or four years earlier. Mm -hmm. How do you think about timing in terms of product and business phase? Yeah, so, so just repeating it. So um, Sal Khan wouldn't have been able to make his business happen three or four years earlier. How do you think about timing when it comes to this space? Um, yeah, timing was actually one of the stories I ended up cutting. Um, I, I think timing is critically important, and unfortunately, it's really hard to it's really hard to predict. Uh, it's kind of related to what what the the tailwind point I, I, I talked about. I mean, I think uh, you know YouTube was far from the first at trying to make online video work. Um, I've had many arguments with Mark Cuban about whether he was the first or not. Um, the, uh, um, I bet I know what he 
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the uh, uh, so timing is timing is kind of everything, uh, and unfortunately, you don't actually know if you're at the right time until afterwards. I, I don't I don't know that there's a prescription there, um, uh, but certainly I think once you once you feel it, maybe that's related to the you know the the insight of what do you believe that other people don't believe. Sometimes that is all entirely about timing that you believe you know the right set of things are coming together to make it happen. I mean, why was YouTube timing at the right right time? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that happened at that at that moment, right? I mean, net networks were finally big enough to be able to stream video. Uh, you know, we we were finally putting a a phone, a, a, sorry, a camera in everyone's pocket. So there was you know the amount of creation that was happening was uh, was was completely different. Um, uh, and then there was a bunch of things in the uh, funding and investment environment that made it easier to imagine taking something that was actually a pretty capital intensive bet that 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 actually made that work. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of things that had to come together at the right moment for. Uh, uh, for that to happen, then a lot of luck comes into it too. Um, so I think timing really matters. So how do you how do you think the virtual reality is going to going to going to play the, its role as the next step of the transformation of entertainment? Um, how do I think that virtual reality would change? Um, uh, let's see. I'll, I'll, uh, John, John's in the back, and John and I have talked about this before. The uh, um, I think virtual reality right now is uh, is a fantastic promise. Um, uh, I think that uh, I think the timing of it is is unclear. Like, I, I think it's you know anybody who's put on an Oculus and gone through one of those demos, uh, you just you can't help but being wowed. I mean, it, it is it is really amazing uh, uh, to see it. Um, and yet, I think one of my lessons from YouTube was, uh, you know, the shift I talked about with, you know, going from uh, broadband to cable to, to internet video. I mean, you can go back to the late '90s and you'll find the same same. I mean, you'll, you can go back earlier and you'll find very uh, uh, similar ideas. Um, but the set of things that have to come together for for virtual reality to get there are, are sort of similar in terms of, you know, the network effects of of devices and content and applications and all of that coming together at the same time. Um, so I don't have a guess on when that'll be. I, I don't think it's quite yet, um, uh, but I do think it'll be great when it when when it happens. One more question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah you talked about uh, wanting to start a company a, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, what made you decide the last time or it's time to drop it to do it? Like, did you have the idea, team, all those things? Yeah, you've had the opportunity a couple of times to start a company, and you've finally gone and done it. So what's changed in the decision making process from when you decided not to do it in the past? Um, that's a good question. So, uh, essentially, when I, when I was at YouTube and people would come to me and say, I want to start a company, I used to ask them two questions, um, generally as a way to discourage them, actually. Uh, and, and, and my two questions were, um, do, you have an, do you have an idea you can't imagine not working on? And do you have a person or team you can't imagine not working with? Um, and uh, my, my, uh, my view, the way I would phrase the question is, if you don't have both, then you shouldn't do it. Uh, and, and generally, that was enough to dissuade a lot of people. Uh, as it turned out, most people had one or not the other, or, or all, sometimes had neither, which I think was uh, uh, particularly interesting. Uh, I, I think the. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 by the way, I don't have a. I'm not so sure those questions have like led to the right startup or not. But that's like as a life choice. That's how I think about it. The uh, uh, for for me, I mean, the simple answer is I, I found those. I found myself answering those both those questions as yes. Um, and once you're at that point, um, I think anyone who started a company will kind of describe it the same way. It's, it's, it's a feeling of like, damn, I'm trapped. Like, I have to do it. Like, I just, you, know, you can't imagine not doing it, and that's when you have to do it. Um, and uh, that's, that was the feeling I had, and so, so I did it. So, uh, uh, so we're going to break now because we're right out of time. Um, thank I can you. stick around if people want to uh, ask That'd questions. That would be awesome, yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thanks.